For 50 years, the Japanese ruled the island of Taiwan, or Formosa, uh, its first colony. Today, the Japanese colonial administration period is looked upon with some nostalgia, but it would be an error to consider it a time of peace and enlightened dictatorship. The Japanese created infrastructure and greatly grew Taiwan's agricultural economy, simultaneously crippling its own domestic farmers' income, but also ruled with a brutal and unequal hand. The turbulent times of the 1920s led to many Formosan political movements. They had their own different individual goals and views on how to achieve uh, freedom and self-representation. In the future, I hope to write more about their struggle towards creating a more free Formosa, but for this piece, I want to focus on one in particular, the Formosan Communist Party. And uh, before I, anyone gets started, a note about me using the phrase Formosa. I use Formosa here when referring to this pre-war Communist Party because that's the name most people seem to have called the island at the time. I feel like doing so would also help distance this particular short-lived party from the CCP or its later political activities on Taiwan um, shortly after World War II. Uh, I see them as two very different entities. This is part one of a two-parter. Um, I ended up writing way too much, so this is, uh, I'm, ver I'm you'll looking forward to part two shortly. Let's start with the flaws of Japanese colonial rule. In comparison with governance in the other major Japanese colony in Korea, colonial governance of Taiwan Island was relatively lenient. Formosa had two decades of civilian governor generals, and the Japanese assimilation policies of language and religion were locally and gradually enforced. With that being said, things still sucked for the average person. From 1895 to 1902, Japanese records show over 8,000 violent confrontations between the colonials and the locals. Some 6,000 to 14,000 native Formosans were killed in the first six months of the occupation, with 12,000 more in the months afterward. 4,600 Formosans were branded as bandits and executed without trial. By the time the 1910s came around, military guerrilla movements had been largely and ruthlessly suppressed, yet there remained deep inequalities between the Japanese minority and the Formosan natives. Japanese occupied all the highest rungs of power and gave little voice to the native Formosans. This is despite a huge population mismatch, some 3 million natives versus 20,000 Japanese in 1914. When the government does not allow for its people to voice their concerns and determine their own fate, the people will naturally start to organize political organizations to create a way forward. The Formosan Communist Party was one of those organizations. As you might guess, this party did not succeed in inciting revolution on Formosa. Throughout its brief existence from 1928 to 1931, it struggled constantly with disunity. It could not unify under a single leader, splitting into two factions aligned with the Japanese and Chinese communist parties, while at the same time being relentlessly pursued by the Japanese police forces, which would successfully, spoiler alert, dismantle the party in 1931. Let's start at the beginning, the founding of the FCP. The Formosan Communist Party drew its roots from left-wing students educated in China and Japan during the 1920s. It can generally be said to have been founded by Lin Mu Shun, or today mostly forgotten, and a woman named Xie Shi Hong. Xie Shi Hong was an interesting character. She was born in October 1901 to a working class family. She was married, basically sold, off at the age of 12 to another family for the cost of 160 Taiwanese dollars. This family greatly mistreated her, a fate not too uncommon for young Chinese women at the time. She somehow found her way to Japan in 1918 and became a career woman, which led to historians labeling her an early feminist icon. She returned to Formosa after finding out her supposed husband was already married to another woman and then fled the Japanese police to Shanghai in 1925, where she participated in anti-imperialist riots, an incident called the May 30th Movement. 
Her work there attracted the interest of the local Chinese Communist Youth Party branch, and they sent her to Russia. Or the Soviet Union, I guess. At the time, the Soviet Union, under Lenin's guidance, actively sought the overthrow of capitalist world governments, so that they may be replaced with communist organizations. These efforts were coordinated through a single international organization called the Communist International, or the Comintern. More on this later. These include revolutionary universities with the goal of promoting revolution. From 1926 to 1927, Xue and her Comrades resided there, learning how to incite revolution. In November 1927, she returned to China and was ordered by the Comintern to begin laying the groundwork for a Formosan Communist Party with the guidance of the Japanese Communist Party. Several CCP members would eventually object to this, uh, but defer to Comintern leadership. The Japanese communists, though, at the time were busy preparing for upcoming elections, and so She and others returned to Shanghai anyway, working alongside the CCP. The FCP's first meeting took place on April 15, 1928, and its divisions was basically clear right off the bat. CCP representative at the meeting, Peng Rong, dismissed the differences between China's and Formosa's political situations and lectured that FCP members should learn from the CCP's experiences without, uh, without even allowing for the other way to, ha to occur, and it would be bad tidings for the future. More on that on the second part of uh, the small write-up on the Formosan Communist Party, part two. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.